This video was brought to you by NordVPN. It seems like every movie is flopping right now, with article after article about disappointing releases. Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny barely made back its money despite being a massive IP. The Flash might be a major superhero release, but it barely made its money back either. And Little Mermaid may have pulled in more money than they spent, but it fell well short of Disney's expectations, with previous live-action remakes earning the mouse literally billions of dollars. The thing is, though, that the maths here is super rudimental. Journalists often like to take the box office performance of a movie and then subtract the cost and call it a day. But the thing is, budgeting movies is much more complicated than that. To truly work out if a movie is a flop or not, you need to account for all kinds of factors. From the box office performance and production budget that we often associate with these kinds of calculations, as well as often skipped metrics like EST, PVOD, TVOD, SVOD, TV, international rights, profit participants, marketing costs, and the varying splits across the industry. Now, many people are too lazy to actually bother calculating these things properly. I mean, I'm calling myself out here too. In all of these videos, we didn't do it properly either, but we're better than that. So let's do the maths properly and work out how much money these movies are really making and how much these movies really flopped, all things considered. <laughs> To work out how profitable a movie is, you need to first account for how much money the movie makes. That is to say, the money coming in. Now, the most obvious and highly cited number here are the box office figures. These are the numbers used to declare films like Indiana Jones, The Little Mermaid, Fast 10, and even Mission Impossible as commercial flops. But it's not quite as simple as you think, or as these journalists would like you to believe. Now, as you know, a movie's box office figure is the amount of revenue from a film's theatrical exhibition. And this number is often split into three separate figures. Opening weekend, domestic box office, and international box office. Fortunately, you're a smart person and those names are pretty self-explanatory. But let's run through them quickly. The opening weekend is the amount of money made from the sale of cinema tickets in the first weekend of a movie's release. It's not necessarily a huge chunk of the money the movie will make over its lifetime, but it's significant because it sets the tone for the movie's release and gives an indication of how well it will perform going forward. Domestic box office is the total revenue from ticket sales in the film's home market, which is almost always the US for our purposes. And then there's the international box office, which is the total revenue from tickets sold elsewhere in the world. Add these together and you have the movie's total box office. That'd be $568 million for The Little Mermaid, $459 million for Elemental, and $378 million for Indiana Jones and The Dial of Destiny. However, not all of this money goes straight back to the studios to cover production costs. So if we want to work out what proportion of ticket sales make its way back to the studio, then we need to look at a graph like this. This is an example of a rental rate chart for a movie theatre. In most markets, rather than buying the rights to display a movie, cinemas rent the films, splitting ticket revenue with the studio who produced it. As you can see though, that split varies throughout the life cycle of the release. At the beginning, when the studio has the most leverage, they can often exert this power to pick up a large chunk of ticket sales, sometimes as high as 80%. But as the movie's release cycle goes on, that rate drops. At this point, the studio no longer has the big hit that everyone cares about, so cinemas are able to negotiate a better rate. Now, this is obviously very contingent on a whole load of factors. What's the movie? How much hype is there? Is there a big star attached? Does the studio hold a lot of weight? How much does the cinema need the movie? But if all of these boxes are ticked, then you can expect the studios to take a lot of revenue in the opening weekend. For example, it's likely that Warner Brothers made a ton of money from Barbie in the opening weekend when rent rates were high and people were desperate to do the Barbenheimer double bill. Because of this, cinemas generally love movies with a slow burn, either films that grow thanks to word of mouth and pick up a late burst of hype, or films which encourage repeat viewings. 
That's because the more tickets that they can sell later in the cycle, the better it is for theaters because they get a higher proportion of the ticket sales. All in all though, many analysts suggest that you can conservatively assume that studios are making back about 50 to 60% of the domestic box office. Now that'll obviously vary depending on the studio's ability to negotiate and when audiences make it to the cinema, but it's a vague guess. And unfortunately, as you'll learn, vague guesses are often as good as we'll get in this industry. It's also worth noting that things are different internationally. Often studios will only be able to negotiate lower rates in international markets, with the average international box office sitting at between 20 and 40%, varying by country. That might be a smaller percentage, but there's still a ton of potential viewers here. So despite these lower rental rates, movie studios can often earn a ton of money from big markets like China, India, and Europe with this even being reflected in the types of movie being made, ones which don't necessarily need as much translation, as well as studios' willingness to censor projects in order to be allowed exhibition. However, once the movie is done with its theatrical exhibition, the movie still has a whole lot of life in front of it, which is good news, considering that the amount of time a movie spends in cinemas has significantly dropped in recent years. So with the theatrical run over, enter a soup of acronyms in EST, TVOD, PVOD, and SVOD. Let's start with EST, which stands for electronic sell-through. This is when you go to a marketplace like iTunes or Amazon Prime and purchase a movie from there. A bit like you might have done with a DVD back in the day. Maybe you still do, no judgment. Now, this is often where movies go straight after the cinema, because while they might not make as much money as they would have done by selling a whole family tickets, they still can charge you about $20 to watch the film, which considering that some studios are able to negotiate a cut as high as 85 or 95%, that's still a lot of money. Universal seem particularly good at this stage of release, regularly boasting about their EST sales numbers. But there is reason to be careful here, because move a movie onto EST too quickly, and you might make more money right now, but you risk teaching audiences to expect your movies to land on EST very quickly after release, cutting off future box office revenue. This is something that Pixar has arguably struggled from, with them releasing movies directly onto streaming during COVID, and seeing some pretty weak results in cinemas since suggesting that audiences might not treat Pixar as the cinematic moment they once did. Now, Universal are aware of this too, with them seemingly delaying the EST release of the super popular Super Mario Bros movie in order to fully cash in at the box office. From here, PVOD often pretty quickly follows on from EST, and is honestly pretty similar. A good example of PVOD is the release of Mulan during the pandemic, here, subscribers to Disney Plus were able to watch the movie on streaming, but there was a catch. They had to pay slightly more money in order to do so. Now, PVOD is often slightly cheaper than EST, but it requires viewers to have a subscription to the base streaming service first. And this is a pretty good deal for studios like Disney, who not only get paid a fee for the stream, but also get new Disney Plus subscribers. After studios think that they've convinced pretty much everyone they can to actively hand over their money, we move into the realm of SVOD, streaming video on demand. That's things like Netflix, Disney+, Max, Paramount, and Peacock. Now, where EST sees the marketplace splitting the purchase price with the studio, in SVOD, things work a little bit differently. Because viewers aren't actively paying for the movie, there's no easy split to offer. And as such, streamers normally agree a flat rate with the studio to house the movie on their platform. Now, this is normally done using a rate card, which streamers use to calculate how much they're willing to pay. The exact formulas used by different streamers vary, but generally the rate card offers a price based on how much money the movie made during its theatrical run sometimes specifically its opening weekend box office. Now, this obviously makes the opening weekend figure yet more important. Not only do opening weekends earn studios a higher chunk of ticket sales, but they also can impact the rates paid by streamers. 
Now, you might be thinking at this point, a majority of the streaming services I mentioned earlier are actually owned by the studios themselves. So, do they charge themselves in order to stream a movie on their own platform? The answer is yes, and for a number of reasons. Firstly, very often the streaming services are technically separate arms of the same business. So while they're not strictly competitors, or even all that competitive, the producers behind a movie will want to see it deliver as much profit as it can for the sake of their own careers, even if that means charging their own company money for the rights to stream the movie. Secondly, charging money for the streaming rights is often just necessary for accounting purposes in order to produce a proper P&L. And thirdly, actors, producers, and directors sometimes get a cut of the movie's profit as part of their contract. So legally, these SVOD fees almost always have to be charged in order for these people to get a fair cut of the entire release. In fact, this can be very serious legally, with one of the financiers of Avatar 2 currently in court with Disney over this exact issue. So yes, even if the streaming service that the movie ends up on is owned by the company who made the film, the studio still gets paid for the movie's placement. And depending on which streaming platform we're talking about, this whole process is sometimes duplicated all over the world. That's because while some streaming services are available essentially everywhere, others have a far more limited reach. And in that instance, the streaming rights can be sold to a number of different companies in different markets. In fact, even the big streamers like Netflix don't have the same catalogue in every country. For instance, Paramount puts all of the Mission Impossible movies on Paramount+. Plus. But you can't access Paramount Plus in India, so instead they distribute it on Voot. While in New Zealand, you can access Paramount content through TVNZ+, or in South Korea, it's on TVing. This windowing model allows studios to extract the most amount of money they can from streaming by choosing the most advantageous player in every region. But it's pretty annoying for customers. That's because you might want to watch a movie on Netflix, which is on the platform, but just not in your country. Or you could be on holiday and not able to access the same library on Hulu as you can at home because of local content or access limitations. That's good for studios, but it's not good for you. Fortunately though, NordVPN can help, allowing you to connect to the internet wherever you want. So if you're on holiday and want to connect to the TV shows that you enjoy watching at home, then you can just use NordVPN to connect back at home. Or if other countries have streaming shows that you want, you can just log into the streaming service using NordVPN to connect to another country's library. Now, NordVPN are actually running a major back to school promotion right now, which means that if you sign up for a two year plan, you not only get a massive discount, but you also get an extra four months. That's a huge discount just for clicking our link. And if you do, then Nord are likely to continue sponsoring the TLDR content. Now, we've been told that sometimes when people hear us talk about NordVPN, they open up a new tab and just start searching. But crucially, don't use our link. Now, I'm certainly glad that they get access to the service, but you only get the discount and support the channel through that link. So if you're trying to improve our journalism by signing up to Nord, then make sure you use our link when you do. And that way you'll also get their great service at a discount. The final step of a movie's life cycle tends to be on TV, with movies generally landing on television a fair while after their release, in order to ensure that the maximum revenue has been extracted before being broadcast to essentially everyone. Even this isn't the end of the monetization pipeline though, especially for franchises, as a movie's life never truly ends. That's because each time a new movie in a series is released, it boosts the popularity of the previous installments, with this providing an opportunity to re-promote old movies on streaming, or even bring them back to theatres for a limited re-release. 
In fact, you could see Disney doing exactly this before the release of the new Indiana Jones movie earlier this summer, where they quickly moved to ensure that all previous Indiana Jones films were shifted over from whichever streaming services they'd been licensed to before back to Disney Plus so that they could benefit from any increased Indiana Jones rewatching. In fact, Disney is a particularly good example of extending movies' profitability, with them regularly using merchandising and theme parks in order to get a bit more cash, with the mouse making billions from their IP even years after its release by selling experiences and products based around popular movies. And honestly, even unpopular ones. In fact, sometimes these things alone can go a fair way in justifying a remake or sequel's production. I'm not saying that the New Little Mermaid, Haunted Mansion, or Indiana Jones movies were just made to boost merchandise and park sales, but all of them are strong existing IPs for Disney, with existing rides at their parks. So it would make sense to increase these brands' lifespan by introducing them to new generations with fresh movies. Okay, so all of that combined is how movies really make money. At the box office, with the opening weekend being the most important and domestic box offices generally earning more than international ones, EST and paid streaming, where big studios can negotiate a hefty chunk of the profits, streaming on demand with the rate broadly dictated by the streamer's rate card, which in turn is often based on the film's box office performance, paid and free TV with rates ranging significantly depending on the markets and if the TV channel is paid or free, Re-release and streaming re-windowing alongside the release of future sequels, prequels, and remakes. And finally, products and experiences, which can pull in a ton of extra cash, especially for studios like Disney and Universal, which have big cell-phoned parks and stores in which to sell their products. This obviously isn't the end of a movie's story, though. Money coming in is great, even if it does have to be split with various third parties throughout, but there's always the money going back out again. The most obvious cost of production is the production budget itself. This is generally a pretty widely circulated number, and it represents the amount of money spent to get the movie onto cinema screens in the first place. Naturally, this includes things like the costs of writing the screenplay, paying for the cast, directors, producers, visual effects artists, set designers, riggers, lighting techs, paying for music, etc, etc. And the thing is, that these production budgets have been slowly sliding upwards recently, with COVID-related precautions, CGI budgets, and flashy visuals forcing the cost of movies to skyrocket with Disney's latest slate of releases costing a truly eye-boggling amount of money, something that we briefly touched on in our video about why Disney is struggling right now. It's linked down below. It's not just the upfront production costs which you've got to contend with, though, because depending on who's working on the film, the contracts of producers, directors, and stars can often include what's known as a profit participation. These profit participants will have something in their contract which entitles them to a share of the movie's final profit. Now, these deals obviously vary widely, but generally, they're based on a percentage of the actual movie studio's net or gross profit from the film. Now, unsurprisingly, it's hard to pin down exactly how much money is distributed in this way, as essentially everyone is incentivized to keep it quiet. But Variety recently reported that Margot Robbie will earn $50 million in profit participation from Barbie, a number which some believe to actually undercount her earnings. Then there's obviously the marketing budget required to actually get you to care about a film in the first place, because if a flop flops in an empty cinema, did it truly flop at all? Now, marketing can take various forms, from trailers and TV ads, to interactive social media campaigns, and YouTube interviews with the cast. All of this costs money, though, with the average major movie spending between $50 and $100 million on marketing, and these days, that number can get even higher. As a rule of thumb though, analysts often suggest that studios tend to spend about 50% of their production budget on marketing. Now, this isn't a truly comprehensive list of the costs and profit sources, but it does represent the main things that studios are looking at, and it goes a hell of a lot further than just taking the box office figure and subtracting the production budget. 
So with that in mind, did these famous 2023 flops actually flop? Well, unfortunately, it's pretty hard to tell, as a lot of these deals and contracts are far from transparent. So we can't ever know exactly how much movies make, which is maybe a good thing for the studios making them. That being said, we can look at the vague maths and say that a movie like the new Indiana Jones film likely isn't making back its costs, with hefty production budgets, marketing spend, and expensive stars likely outweighing even the most optimistic visions for the future of the movie. On the other hand, it's very possible that the new Little Mermaid, widely described as a flop, could end up making Disney some money once all of the streaming, parks, and merchandise profits are lumped in. Now, it definitely underperformed expectations, but it's difficult to say for sure whether Little Mermaid was a flop, as it is with essentially every other movie, unfortunately. One reason that people did say that it flopped, though, was because it went woke. So we made a whole video unpacking that concept that Hollywood has been making woke movies that no one wants. In order to do that, we collected a ton of data, analyzed over 60 movies, and got survey data from over a thousand TLDR viewers so that we could fully mathematically analyze that assumption. And if you're interested in what we found out, then click the link to watch it right now. Also, be sure to subscribe for future videos, and thanks for watching.